Aux Italiens by Edward Robert Bulwer Lytton. Read for LibriVox.org by Kristen Hughes. At Paris it was at the opera there, and she looked like a queen in a book that night, with the wreath of pearl in her raven hair and the brooch on her breast so bright. Of all the operas that Verde wrote, the best, to my taste, is the Trovatore, and Mario can soothe with a tenor note the souls in purgatory. The moon on the tower slept soft as snow, and who was not thrilled in the strangest way, as we heard him sing while the gas burned low, Non ti scordar di me. The emperor there, in his box of state, looked grave, as if he had just then seen the red flag wave from the city gate, where his eagles in bronze had been. The empress, too, had a tear in her eye. You'd have said that her fancy had gone back again for one moment under the old blue sky, to the old glad life in Spain. Well, there in our front row box we sat, together my bride betrothed and I. My gaze was fixed on my opera hat and hers on the stage hard by. And both were silent, and both were sad. Like a queen she leaned on her full white arm, with that regal, indolent air she had, so confident of her charm. I have not a doubt she was thinking then of her former lord, good soul that he was, who died the richest and roundest of men, the Marquis of Carabas. I hope that to get to the kingdom of heaven, through a needle's eye he had not to pass. I wish him well for the jointure given to my lady of Carabas. Meanwhile I was thinking of my first love, as I had not been thinking of aught for years, till over my eyes there began to move something that felt like tears. I thought of the dress that she wore last time, when we stood neath the cypress trees together. In that lost land, in that soft clime, In the crimson evening weather, Of that muslin dress, for the eve was hot, And her warm white neck in its golden chain, And her full soft hair just tied in a knot And falling loose again, And the jasmine flower in her fair young breast, Oh, the faint sweet smell of that jasmine flower, and the one bird singing alone to his nest, and the one star over the tower. I thought of our little quarrels and strife, and the letter that brought me back my ring, and it all seemed then in the waste of life such a very little thing, for I thought of her grave below the hill, which the sentinel cypress tree stands o'er, and I thought— were she only living still, how I could forgive her and love her. And I swear as I thought of her thus in that hour, and of how, after all, old things were best, that I smelt the smell of that jasmine flower which she used to wear in her breast. It smelt so faint, and it smelt so sweet. It made me creep, and it made me cold. Like the scent that steals from the crumbling sheet Where a mummy is half unrolled. And I turned and looked. She was sitting there in a dim box over the stage, And dressed in that muslin dress, With that full soft hair, And that jasmine in her breast. I was here, and she was there, And the glittering horseshoe curved between, From my bride betrothed with her raven hair, and her sumptuous, scornful mien, to my early love with her eyes downcast, and over her primrose face the shade, in short, from the future back to the past, there was but a step to be made. To my early love from my future bride, one moment I looked. Then I stole to the door, I traversed the passage, and down at her side I was sitting a moment more. My thinking of her, or the music's strain, or something which will never be expressed, had brought her back from the grave again with the jasmine in her breast. She is not dead, and she is not wed, but she loves me now, and she loved me then, 
and the very first word that her sweet lips said, my heart grew youthful again. The marchioness there of Carabas, she is wealthy and young and handsome still, and but for her, well, we'll let that pass, she may marry whomever she will. But I will marry my own first love, with her primrose face, for old things are best. And the flower in her bosom, I prize it above the brooch in my lady's breast. The world is filled with folly and sin, and love must cling where it can, I say. For beauty is easy enough to win, but one isn't loved every day. And I think in the lives of most women and men, there's a moment when all would go smooth and even, if only the dead could find out when to come back and be forgiven. But oh, the smell of that jasmine flower, and oh, that music, and oh, the way that voice rang out from the donjon tower. Non ti scordar de me, non ti scordar de me. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Cry of the Children by Elizabeth Barrett Browning Read for LibriVox by Christy Nowak Alas, alas, my children, why do you look upon me? The Medea of Euripides Do ye hear the children weeping, O my brothers, ere the sorrow comes with years? They are leaning their young heads against their mothers, and that cannot stop their tears. The young lambs are bleeding in the meadows, the young birds are chirping in the nest, the young fawns are playing with the shadows, the young flowers are blowing toward the west, but the young, young children, oh, my brothers, they are weeping bitterly. They are weeping in the playtime of the others in the country of the free. Do you question the young children in the sorrow why their tears are falling so? Old man may weep for his tomorrow, which is lost in long ago. The old tree is leafless in the forest, the old year is ending in the frost. The old wound, if stricken, is the sorest, the old hope is the hardest to be lost. But the young, young children, O oh my brothers, do you ask them why they stand, weeping sore before the bosoms of their mothers, in our happy fatherland? They look up with their pale and sunken faces, and their looks are sad to see, for the man's hoary anguish draws and presses down the cheeks of infancy. Your old earth, they say, is very dreary. Our young feet, they say, are very weak. Few paces have we taken, yet are weary. Our grave rest is very far to seek. Ask the aged why they weep and not the children, for the outside earth is cold, and we young ones stand without, in our bewildering, and the graves are for the old. True, say the children, it may happen that we die before our time. Little Alice died last year. Her grave is shapen like a snowball in the rhyme. We looked into the pit, prepared to take her. Was no room for any work in the close clay. From the sleep wherein she lieth, none will wake her, crying, Get up, little Alice, it is day. If you listen by that grave in sun and shower, With your ear down, little Alice never cries. Could we see her face, be sure we should not know her, For the smile has time for growing in her eyes, And merry go her moments, lulled and stilled In the shroud by the kirk chime. It is good when it happens, say the children, that we die before our time. Alas, alas, the children, they are seeking death in life as best to have. They are binding up their hearts away from breaking with a cerement from the grave. Go out, children, from the mine and from the city. Sing out, children, as the little thrushes do. Pluck your handfuls of the meadow cowslips pretty. Laugh aloud to feel your fingers let them through. 
but they answer are your cowslips of the meadows like our weeds anear the mine leave us quiet in the dark of the coal shadows from your pleasures fair and fine for oh say the children we are weary and we cannot run or leap if we cared for any meadows it were merely to drop down in them and sleep our knees tremble sorely in the stooping we fall upon our faces trying to go and underneath our heavy eyelids drooping the reddest flower would look as pale as snow for all day we drag our burden tiring through the coal dark underground or all day we drive the wheels of iron in the factories round and round. For all day the wheels are droning, turning, their wind comes in our faces, till our hearts turn, our heads with pulses burning, and the walls turn in their places. Turns the sky in the high window, blank and reeling, turns the long light that drops adown the wall. Turn the black flies that crawl along the ceiling. All are turning all the day, and we with all. And all day the iron wheels are droning. And sometimes we could pray, O oh, ye wheels, breaking out in mad moaning, Stop! Be silent for today. I be silent. Let them hear each other breathing for a moment mouth to mouth. Let them touch each other's hands in a fresh wreathing of their tender human youth. Let them feel that this cold metallic motion is not all the life God fashions or reveals. Let them prove their living souls against the notion that they live in you or under you, O oh wheels. Still, all day the iron wheels go onward, grinding life down from its mark, and the children's souls which God is calling sunward, spin on blindly in the dark. Now, tell the poor young children, O oh my brothers, to look up to him and pray, so the blessed one who blesseth all the others will bless them another day. They answer, Who is God that he should hear us while the rushing of the iron wheels is stirred? When we sob aloud, the human creatures near us pass by, hearing not, or answer not a word. And we hear not, for the wheels in their resounding, strangers speaking at the door, is it likely God with angels shining round him hears our weeping any more? Two words indeed of praying we remember, and at midnight's hour of harm, our Father, looking upward in the chamber, we say softly for a charm. We know no other words except our Father, and we think that in some pause of angel song God may pluck them from the silence sweet to gather and hold both within his right hand, which is strong. Our Father! If he heard us, he would surely, for they call to him good and mild, answer, smiling down the steep world very purely, Come and rest with me, my child. But no, say the children, weeping faster, he is speechless as a stone, and they tell us of his image as the master who commands us to work on. Go to, say the children, up in heaven, dark, wheel-like, turning clouds are all we find. Do not mock us, grief has made us unbelieving. We look up for God, but tears have made us blind. Do you hear the children weeping and disproving, O oh, my brothers, what ye preach? For God's possible is taught by his world's loving, and the children doubt of each. And may well the children weep before you, they are weary ere they run. They have never seen the sunshine, nor the glory, which is brighter than the sun. They know the grief of man without its wisdom. They sing in man's despair without its calm are slaves with the liberty of christom are martyrs by the pang without the palm are worn as if with age yet unretrievingly the harvest of its memories cannot reap are orphans of the earthly love and heavenly let them weep let them weep they look up with their pale and sunken faces and their look is dread to see for they mind you of their angels in high places with eyes turned on deity. How long, 
they say. How long, O cruel nation, will you stand to move the world on a child's heart? Stifled down with a mailed heel its palpitation, and tread onward to your throne amid the mart. Our blood splashes upward, O gold heaper, and your purple shows your path. But the child's sob in the silence curses deeper than the strong man in his wrath. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Keeping of the Bridge from Lays of Ancient Rome by Lord Macaulay. Read for LibriVox.org by Andy Minter. Lars Porsena of Clusium, by the nine gods he swore, that the great house of Tarquin should suffer wrong no more. By the nine gods he swore it, and named a trysting day, and bade his messengers ride forth, east and west and south and north, to summon his array. East and west and south and north the messengers ride fast, and tower and town and cottage have heard the trumpet's blast. Shame on the false Etruscan, who lingers in his home, when Porsena of Clusium is on the march for Rome. The horsemen and the footmen are pouring in amain, from many a stately market-place, from many a fruitful plain, from many a lonely hamlet, which, hid by beech and pine, like an eagle's nest, hangs on the crest of purple Apennine. From lordly Volaterrae, where scowls the far-famed hold, piled by the hands of giants, for godlike kings of old. From sea-girt Populonia, whose sentinels descry Sardinia's snowy mountain-tops, fringing the southern sky. From the proud mart of Pisae, queen of the western waves, where ride Massilia's triremes, heavy with fair-haired slaves. From where sweet Clannis wanders, through corn and vines and flowers, from where Cortona lifts to heaven her diadem of towers. Tall are the oaks whose acorns drop in dark Orsa's rill, fat are the stags that champ the boughs of the Ciminian hill. Beyond all streams Clytumnus is to the herdsman dear, best of all pools the fowler loves the great Volsinian mere. But now no stroke of woodman is heard by Orsa's rill, no hunter tracks the stag's green path up the Ciminian hill. Unwatched along Clytumnus grazes the milk-white steer. Unharmed the waterfowl may dip in the Volsinian mere. The harvests of Aretium this year old men shall reap. This year young boys in Umbro shall plunge the struggling sheep. And in the vats of Luna this year the must shall foam round the white feet of laughing girls whose sires have marched to Rome. There be thirty chosen prophets, the wisest of the land, who always by Lars Porcina both morn and evening stand. Evening and morn the thirty have turned the verses o'er, traced from the right on linen white by mighty seers of yore. And with one voice the thirty have their glad answer given. Go forth, go forth, Lars Porcina, go forth, beloved of heaven. Go and return in glory to Clusium's royal dome, and hang round Nursia's altars the golden shields of Rome. And now hath every city sent up her tale of men, the foot are fourscore thousand, the horse are thousands ten. Before the gates of Sutrium is met the great array, a proud man was Lars Porcina upon the trysting day. For all the Etruscan armies were ranged beneath his eye, and many a banished Roman, and many a stout ally, and with a mighty following to join the muster came the Tusculan Mamilius, prince of the Latian name. But by the yellow Tiber was tumult and affright, from all the spacious Champagne to Rome men took their flight. A mile around the city the throng stopped up the ways, a fearful sight it was to see through two long nights and days, for aged folks on crutches, 
and women great with child, and mothers sobbing over babes that clung to them and smiled, and sick men born in litters high on the necks of slaves, and troops of sunburnt husbandmen with reaping hooks and staves, and droves of mules and asses laden with skins of wine, and endless flocks of goats and sheep, and endless herds of kine, and endless trains of wagons that creaked beneath the weight of corn-sacks and of household goods, choked every roaring gate. Now from the rock Tarpeian could the one burghers spy the line of blazing villages red in the midnight sky. The fathers of the city they sat all night and day, for every hour some horsemen come with tidings of dismay. To eastward and to westward have spread the Tuscan bands, Nor house, nor fence, nor dovecote in Crustomerium stands. Verbena down to Ostia hath wasted all the plain, Aster hath stormed Janiculum, and the stout guards are slain. I wis in all the Senate there was no heart so bold, But saw it ached and fast it beat, when that ill news was told. Forthwith up rose the consul, up rose the fathers all. In haste they girded up their gowns, and hide them to the wall. They held a council standing before the river-gate. Short time was there, ye well may guess, for musing or debate. Out spake the consul roundly, The bridge must straight go down, For since Janiculum is lost, naught else can save the town. Just then a scout came flying, all wild with haste and fear. To arms, to arms, Sir Consul, Lars Porsena is here. On the low hills to westward the Consul fixed his eye, and saw the swarthy storm of dust rise fast along the sky. And nearer, fast and nearer, doth the red whirlwind come, and louder still, and still more loud, from underneath that rolling cloud is heard the trumpet's war-note proud the trampling and the hum, and plainly and more plainly now through the gloom appears, far to left and far to right, in broken gleams of dark blue light, the long array of helmets bright, the long array of spears. And plainly and more plainly above that glimmering line, now might ye see the banners of twelve fair cities shine, but the banner of proud Clusium was highest of them all, the terror of the Umbrian, the terror of the Gaul. And plainly and more plainly now might the burghers know, by port and vest, by horse and crest, each warlike Lucumo, their Schilnius of Aritium on his fleet Rhone was seen, and Aster of the fourfold shield, girt with the brand none else may wield, Talumnius with the belt of gold, and dark Verbena from the hold by reedy Thrasimene. Fast by the royal standard, o'er looking all the war, Lars Porsena of Clusium sat in his ivory car. By the right wheel rode Mamilius, prince of the Latian name, and by the left false Sextus, that wrought the deed of shame. But when the face of Sextus was seen among the foes, a yell that rent the firmament from all the town arose. On the house-tops was no woman, but spat towards him and hissed, No child but screamed out curses, and shook its little fist. But the consul's brow was sad, and the consul's speech was low, And darkly looked he at the wall, and darkly at the foe. Their van will be upon us before the bridge goes down, And if they once may win the bridge, what hope to save the town? Then out spoke brave Horatius, the captain of the gate. To every man upon this earth death cometh soon or late, And how can man die better than facing fearful odds For the ashes of his fathers and the temples of his gods? And for the tender mother who dandled him to rest, And for the wife who nurses his baby at her breast, And for the holy maidens who feed the eternal flame, to save them from false Sextus, that wrought the deed of shame. Haul down the bridge, Sir Consul, with all the speed ye may. I, with two more to help me, will hold the foe in play. In yon straight path a thousand may well be stopped by three. 
Now who will stand on either hand, And keep the bridge with me? Then out spake Spurius Lartius, A Ramnian proud was he, Lo, I will stand at thy right hand, And keep the bridge with thee. And out spake strong Herminius, Of Titian blood was he, I will abide on thy left side, And keep the bridge with thee. Horatius, quoth the consul, As thou sayest, so let it be. And straight against that great array Forth went the dauntless three, For Romans in Rome's quarrel Spared neither land nor gold, Nor son, nor wife, nor limb, nor life, In the brave days of old. Then none was for a party, Then all were for the state, then the great man helped the poor, and the poor man loved the great. Then lands were fairly portioned, then spoils were fairly sold. The Romans were like brothers in the brave days of old. Now Roman is to Roman more hateful than a foe, and the tribunes beard the high, and the fathers grind the low. As we wax hot in faction, in battle we wax cold. Wherefore men fight not as they fought in the brave days of old. Now while the three were tightening their harness on their backs, the consul was the foremost man to take in hand an axe, and fathers mixed with commons seized hatchet, bar, and crow, and smote upon the planks above and loosed the props below. Meanwhile the Tuscan army, right glorious to behold, came flashing back the noonday light. Rank behind rank, like surges bright of a broad sea of gold. Four hundred trumpets sounded a peal of warlike glee, As that great host, with measured tread, And spears advanced, and ensigns spread, Rolled slowly towards the bridge's head, Where stood the dauntless three. The three stood calm and silent, And looked upon the foes, and a great shout of laughter from all the vanguard rose, and four three chiefs came spurring before that deep array. To earth they sprang, their swords they drew, and lifted high their shields, and flew to win the narrow way. Ornus from green Typhernum, lord of the hill of vines, and Saeus, whose eight hundred slaves sicken in Ilva's mines, and Picus, long to Clusium vassal in peace and war, who led to fight his Umbrian powers from that grey crag where, girt with towers, the fortress of Nequinium lowers over the pale waves of Nar. Stout Lartius hurled down Ornus into the stream beneath. Herminius struck at Saeus and clove him to the teeth. At Picus, brave Horatius darted one fiery thrust, and the proud Umbrian's gilded arms clashed in the bloody dust. Then Ochnus of Falerii rushed on the Roman three, and Lausulus of Ergo, the rover of the sea, and Arons of Volsinium, who slew the great wild boar, the great wild boar that has his den amidst the reeds of Cossus' fen, and wasted fields and slaughtered men along Albinia's shore. Herminius smote down Arons, Lartius laid Ochnus low, Right to the heart of Lausulus, Horatius sent a blow. Lie there, he cried, fell pirate, no more aghast and pale. From Ostia's walls the crowd shall mark the track of thy destroying bark. No more Campania's hinds shall fly to woods and caverns when they spy thy thrice accursed sail. But now no sound of laughter was heard among the foes. A wild and wrathful clamour from all the vanguard rose. Six spears' length from the entrance halted that deep array, and for a space no man came forth to win the narrow way. But hark, the cry is Aster, and lo, the ranks divide, and the great lord of Luna comes with his stately stride. Upon his ample shoulders clangs loud the fourfold shield, and in his hand he shakes the brand which none but he can wield. He smiled on those bold Romans, a smile serene and high. He eyed the flinching Tuscans, and scorn was in his eye. Quoth he, the she-wolf's litter stands savagely at bay. But will ye dare to follow, if Aster clears the way? Then, whirling up his broadsword with both hands to the height, 
He rushed against Horatius, and smote with all his might. With shield and blade Horatius right deftly turned the blow. The blow, though turned, came yet too nigh. It missed his helm, but gashed his thigh. The Tuscans raised a joyful cry to see the red blood flow. He reeled, and on Herminius he lent one breathing space. Then, like a wild cat mad with wounds, sprang right at Astor's face. Through teeth and skull and helmet, so fierce a thrust he sped. The good sword stood a hand-breadth out behind the Tuscan's head. And the great lord of Luna fell at that deadly stroke, As falls on Mount Alvernus a thunder-smitten oak. Far o'er the crashing forest the giant arms lie spread, And the pale augurs, muttering low, gaze on the blasted head. On Astor's throat Horatius right firmly pressed his heel, And thrice and four times tugged amain, ere he wrenched out the steel. And see, he cried, the welcome, fair guests that waits you here, What noble Lucumo comes next to taste our Roman cheer? But at his haughty challenge a sullen murmur ran, Mingled of wrath and shame and dread. Along that glittering van there lacked not men of prowess, nor men of lordly race, for all Etruria's noblest were round the fatal place. But all Etruria's noblest felt their hearts sink to see on the earth the bloody corpses, in the path the dauntless three, and from the ghastly entrance where those bold Romans stood, all shrank like boys who unaware, ranging the woods to start a hare, Come to the mouth of the dark lair, where, growling low, a fierce old bear lies amidst bones and blood. Was none who would be foremost to lead such dire attack. But those behind cried forward, and those before cried back. And backward now and forward wavers the deep array, and on the tossing sea of steel to and fro the standards reel and the victorious trumpet-peal dies fitfully away. Yet one man for one moment strode out before the crowd. Well known was he to all the three, and they gave him greeting loud. Now welcome, welcome, Sextus, now welcome to thy home. Why dost thou stay and turn away? Here lies the road to Rome. Thrice looked he at the city, thrice looked he at the dead. And thrice came on in fury, and thrice turned back in dread, And white with fear and hatred, scowled at the narrow way, Where, wallowing in a pool of blood, the bravest Tuscans lay. But meanwhile axe and lever have manfully been plied, And now the bridge hangs tottering above the boiling tide. Come back, come back, Horatius, loud cried the fathers all, Back, Lartius, back, Herminius, back, ere the ruin fall. Back darted Spurius Lartius, Herminius darted back, And as they passed, beneath their feet they felt the timbers crack. But when they turned their faces, and on the farther shore, Saw brave Horatius stand alone, they would have crossed once more. But with a crash like thunder fell every loosened beam, And like a dam the mighty wreck lay right athwart the stream, And a long shout of triumph rose from the walls of Rome, as to the highest turret-tops was splashed the yellow foam. And like a horse unbroken when first he feels the rein, the furious river struggled hard and tossed his tawny mane, and burst the curb and bounded, rejoicing to be free, and whirling down in fierce career, battlement and plank and pier rushed headlong to the sea. Alone stood brave Horatius, but constant still in mind, Thrice thirty thousand foes before, and the broad flood behind. Down with him cried false Sextus, with a smile on his pale face. Now yield thee, cried Lars Porcina, now yield thee to our grace. Round turned he, as not deigning those craven ranks to see. Nought spake he to Lars Porcina, to Sextus nought spake he. But he saw on Palatinus the white porch of his home. And he spake to the noble river that rolls by the towers of Rome. O Tiber, father Tiber, to whom the Romans pray, 
A Roman's life, a Roman's arms, take thou in charge this day. So he spake, and speaking, sheathed the good sword by his side, and with his harness on his back, plunged headlong in the tide. No sound of joy or sorrow was heard from either bank, but friends and foes in dumb surprise, with parted lips and straining eyes, stood gazing where he sank. And when above the surges they saw his crest appear, all Rome sent forth a rapturous cry, and even the ranks of Tuscany could scarce forbear to cheer. But fiercely ran the current, swollen high by months of rain, and fast his blood was flowing, and he was sore in pain, and heavy with his armour, and spent with changing blows, and oft they thought him sinking, but still again he rose. Never I ween did swimmer, in such an evil case, struggle through such a raging flood, safe to the landing-place. But his limbs were borne up bravely by the brave heart within, and our good father Tiber bare bravely up his chin. Curse on him, quoth false Sextus, will not the villain drown? But for this stay, ere close of day, we should have sacked the town. Heaven help him, quoth Lars Porcina, and bring him safe to shore, for such a gallant feat of arms was never seen before. And now he feels the bottom, now on dry earth he stands, now round him throng the fathers to press his gory hands. And now, with shouts and clapping, and noise of weeping loud, He enters through the river-gate, borne by the joyous crowd. They gave him of the cornland, that was of public right, As much as two strong oxen could plough from morn till night, And they made a molten image, and set it up on high, And there it stands unto this day, to witness if I lie. It stands in the Comitium, plain for all folk to see, Horatius in his harness, halting upon one knee, And underneath is written, in letters all of gold, How valiantly he kept the bridge in the brave days of old. And still his name sounds stirring unto the men of Rome, As the trumpet blast that cries to them to charge the Volsian home, and wives still pray to Juno for boys with hearts as bold as his who kept the bridge so well in the brave days of old. And in the nights of winter, when the cold north winds blow, and the long howling of the wolves is heard amidst the snow, when round the lonely cottage roars loud the tempest's din, and the good logs of Algidus roar louder yet within, when the oldest cask is opened, and the largest lamp is lit, When the chestnuts glow in the embers, and the kid turns on the spit, When young and old encircle around the firebrands close, When the girls are weaving baskets, and the lads are shaping bows, When the good man mends his armour, and trims his helmet's plume, When the good wife's shuttle merrily goes flashing through the loom, with weeping and with laughter still is the story told, How well Horatius kept the bridge in the brave days of old. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Mort to Arthur by Alfred Lord Tennyson Read for LibriVox.org by Alan Davis Drake in Long Branch, New Jersey. So all day long the noise of battle rolled among the mountains by the winter sea, until King Arthur's table, man by man, had fallen in lioness about their lord, King Arthur. Then, because his wound was deep, the bold Sir Bedivere uplifted him, Sir Bedivere, the last of all his knights and bore him to a chapel nigh the field, a broken chancel with a broken cross that stood on a dark strait of barren land. On one side lay the ocean, and on one lay a great water, and the moon was full. Then spake King Arthur to Sir Bedivere, The sequel of today unsolders all the goodliest fellowship of famous knights whereof this world holds record. 
such a sleep they sleep, the men I loved. I think that we shall never more, at any future time, delight our souls with talk of knightly deeds, walking about the gardens and the halls of Camelot, as in the days that were. I perish by this people which I made, though Merlin swear that I should come again to rule once more. But let what will be, be. I am so deeply smitten through the helm that without help I cannot last till morn. Thou, therefore, take my brand Excalibur, which was my pride, for thou rememberest how, in those old days, one summer noon, an arm rose up out of the bosom of the lake, clothed in white samite, mystic, wonderful, holding the sword, and how I rode across and took it, and have worn it like a king. And wheresoever I am sung or told in aftertime, this also shall be known. But now delay not, take Excalibur, and fling him far into the middle mere. Watch what thou seest, and lightly bring me word. To him replied the bold Sir Bedivere, It is not meet, Sir King, to leave thee thus, aidless alone and smitten through the helm. A little thing may harm a wounded man. Yet I thy hest will all perform at full. Watch what I see, and lightly bring thee word. So saying, from the ruined shrine he stepped, and in the moon athwart the place of tombs, where lay the mighty bones of ancient men, old knights, and over them the sea wind sang shrill chill with flakes of foam. He stepped down by zigzag paths and juts of pointed rock, came on the shining levels of the lake. There he drew forth the brand Excalibur, and o'er him drawing it the winter moon brightening the skirts of a long cloud, ran forth and sparkled keen with frost against the hilt, for all the haft twinkled with diamond sparks, myriads of topaz lights, and jacinth work of subtlest jewelry. He gazed so long that both his eyes were dazzled as he stood, this way and that dividing the swift mine in act to throw. But at the last it seemed better to leave Excalibur concealed there in the many knotted water flags that whistled stiff and dry about the marge. So strode he back slow to the wounded king. Then spake King Arthur to Bedivere, Hast thou performed my mission which I gave? What is thou hast seen, or what hast heard? An answer made the bold to Bedivere. I heard the ripple washing in the reeds, and the wild water lapping on the crag. To whom replied King Arthur, faint and pale, Thou hast betrayed thy nature and thy name, not rendering true answer, as beseemed thy fealty, nor like a noble knight. For surer sign had followed, either hand or voice, or else a motion of the mere. This is a shameful thing for men to lie, Yet now I charge thee, quickly go again, as thou art lief and dear, and do the thing I bade thee. Watch, and lightly bring me word. Then went Sir Bedivere the second time across the ridge, and paced beside the mere, counting the dewy pebbles, fixed in thought. But when he saw the wonder of the hilt, how curiously and strangely chased, he smote his palms together, and he cried aloud, and if indeed I cast the brand away, surely the precious thing, one worthy note, should thus be lost for ever from the earth, which might have pleased the eyes of many men. What good should follow this, if this were done? What harm undone? Deep harm to disobey, seeing obedience is the bond of rule. Were it well to obey, then, if a king demand an act unprofitable against himself. The king is sick, and knows not what he does. What record or what relic of my lord should be to after time, but empty breath and rumors of doubt? But were this kept, stored in some treasure-house of mighty kings, someone might show it in a joust of arms, saying, King Arthur's sword Excalibur, wrought by the lovely maiden of the lake, Nine years she wrought it, sitting in the depths upon the hidden bases of the hills. 
So might some old man speak in the aftertime to all the people, winning reverence. But now much honor and much fame were lost. So spake he, clouded with his own conceit, and hid Excalibur the second time, and so strode back slow to the wounded king. Then spoke King Arthur, breathing heavily, What is it thou hast seen, or what hast heard? An answer made the bold Sir Bedivere. I heard the water lapping on the crag, and the long ripple washing in the reeds. To whom replied King Arthur, much in wrath, Ah, miserable and unkind, untrue, unknightly traitor-hearted, woe is me! Authority forgets a dying king, laid widowed of the power of his eye that bowed the will. I see thee what thou art, for thou, the latest left of all my knights, in whom should meet the offices of all, thou wouldst betray me for the precious hilt, either from lust of gold or like a girl vaulting the giddy pleasures of the eyes. Yet, for a man may fail in duty twice, and the third time may prosper, get thee hence. But if thou spare to fling Excalibur, I will arise and slay thee with my hands. Then quickly rose Sir Bedivere and ran, and leaping down the ridges lightly, plunged among the bulrush beds and clutched the sword and strongly wheeled, and threw it. The great brand made lightning in the splendor of the moon, and flashing round and round, and whirled in an arc, shot like a streamer in the northern morn. See where the moving isles of winter shock by night with noises of the northern sea. So flashed and fell the brand Excalibur. But ere he dipped the surface, rose an arm clothed in white samite, mystic, wonderful, and caught him by the hilt, and brandished him three times, and drew him under in the mere, and lightly went the other to the king. Then spoke King Arthur, drawing thicker breath, Now I see by thine eyes that this is done. Speak out, what is it thou hast heard or seen? An answer made the bold Sir Bedivere, Sir King, I closed mine eyelids, lest the gem should blind my purpose, for I never saw nor shall see here or elsewhere till I die, not though I live three lives of mortal men, so great a miracle as yonder hilt. Then with both hands I flung him, wheeling him, but when I looked again, behold, an arm, clothed in white samite, mystic, wonderful, that caught him by the hilt, and brandished him three times, and drew him under in the mirror. An answer made King Arthur, breathing hard, My end draws nigh, tis time that I were gone. Make broad thy shoulder to receive my weight, and bear me to the margin. Yet I fear my wound hath taken cold, and I shall die. So saying, from the pavement he half rose, slowly, with pain, reclining on his arm, and looking wistfully with wide blue eyes, as in a picture. Him Sir Bedivere remorsefully regarded through his tears, and would have spoken, but he found not words, then took with care, and kneeling on one knee, o'er both his shoulders, drew the languid hands, and rising, bore him through the place of tombs. But as he walked, King Arthur panted hard, like one that feels a nightmare on his bed when all the house is mute. So sighed the king, muttering and murmuring in his ear, Quick, quick, I fear it is too late, and I shall die. But the other swiftly strode from ridge to ridge, clothed with his breath, and looking, as he walked, larger than human on the frozen hills. He heard the deep behind him, and a cry before. His own thought drove him, like a goad. Dry clashed his harness in the icy caves and the barren chasms, and all to left and right the bare black cliff clanged round him, as he based his feet on juts of slippery crag that rang sharp smitten with the dint of armed heels. And on a sudden, lo, the level lake, 
and the long glories of the winter morn. Then saw they how there hove a dusky barge, dark as a funeral scarf from stem to stern beneath them, and descending they were aware that all the decks were dense with stately forms, black-stoled, black-hooded like a dream. But these three queens with crowns of gold, and from them rose a cry that shivered to the tingling stars, and as it were one voice, an agony of lamentation, like a wind that shrills all night in a wasteland, where no one comes or hath come since the making of the world. Then murmured Arthur, Place me on the barge. And to the barge they came. There those three queens put forth their hands and took the king and wept. But she that rose the tallest of them all and fairest laid his head upon her lap and loosened the shattered cask and chafed his hands and called him by his name, complaining loud and dropping bitter tears against his brow striped with dark blood. For all his face was white and colorless, like the withered moon smote by the fresh beam of the springing east, and all his greaves and creases dashed with drops of onset, and the light and lustrous curl that made his forehead like a rising sun high from the dais throne were parched with dust or clotted into points and hanging loose, mixed with the nightly growth that fringed his lips. So like a shattered column lay the king, not like that Arthur who, with lance at rest, from spur to plume a star of tournament, shot through the lists at Camelot, and charged before the eyes of ladies and kings. Then loudly cried the bold Sir Bedivere, Ah, my lord Arthur, whither shall I go? Where shall I hide my forehead and my eyes? For now I see the true old times are dead when every morning brought a noble chance, and every chance brought out a noble night. Such times have not been since the light that led the holy elders with the gift of myrrh, and now the whole round table is dissolved, which was an image of the mighty world. And I, the last, go forth companionless, and the days darken round me, and the years among new men, strange faces, other minds. And slowly answered Arthur from the barge, The old order changeth, yielding place to new, and God fulfills himself in many ways, lest one good custom should corrupt the world. Comfort thyself, what comfort is in me? I have lived my life, and that which I have done may he within himself make pure. But thou, if thou shouldst never see my face again, pray for my soul. More things are wrought by prayer than this world dreams of. Wherefore, let thy voice rise like a fountain for me day and night. For what are men better than sheep or goats that nourish a blind life within the brain? If, knowing God, they lift not hands of prayer both for themselves and for those who call them friend. For so the whole round earth is every way bound by gold chains about the feet of God. But now farewell. I am going a long way with these thou seest, if indeed I go, for all my mind is clouded with a doubt, to the island valley of Avalon, where falls not hail or rain or any snow, nor ever wind blows loudly, but it lies deep-meadowed, happy, fair with orchard lawns and bowery hollows crowned with summer sea, where I will heal me of my grievous wounds. So said he, and the barge with oar and sail moved from the brink, like some full-breasted swan that fluting a wild carol ere her death ruffles her pure cold plume and takes the flood with swarthy webs. Long stood Sir Bedivere, revolving many memories, till the hull looked one black dot against the verge of dawn, and on the mere the wailing died away. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain.
Patterns by Amy Lowell Read for LibriVox.org by Kristen Hughes I walk down the garden paths And all the daffodils are blowing And the bright blue squills I walk down the patterned garden paths In my stiff brocaded gown With my powdered hair and jewelled fan I too am a rare pattern As I walk down the garden paths my dress is richly figured, and the train makes a pink and silver stain on the gravel and the thrift of the borders. Just a plate of current fashion, tripping by in high-heeled ribbon shoes. Not a softness anywhere about me, only whalebone and brocade. And I sink on a seat in the shade of a lime tree, for my passion wars against the stiff brocade. The daffodils and squills flutter in the breeze as they please, and I weep. For the lime tree is in blossom, and one small flower has dropped upon my bosom. And the plashing of water drops in the marble fountain comes down the garden paths. The dripping never stops. Underneath my stiffened gown is the softness of a woman bathing in a marble basin. A basin in the midst of hedges grown so thick She cannot see her lover hiding But she guesses he is near And the sliding of the water Seems the stroking of a dear hand upon her What is summer in a fine brocaded gown? I should like to see it lying in a heap upon the ground All the pink and silver crumpled up on the ground I would be the pink and silver as I ran along the paths, and he would stumble after, bewildered by my laughter. I should see the sun flashing from his sword hilt and the buckles on his shoes. I would choose to lead him in a maze along the pattern paths, a bright and laughing maze for my heavy-booted lover, till he caught me in the shade, and the buttons of his waistcoat bruised my body as he clasped me, aching melting, unafraid, with the shadows of the leaves and the sun-drops, and the plopping of the water-drops all about us in the open afternoon. I am very like to swoon with the weight of his brocade, for the sun sifts through the shade. Underneath the fallen blossom in my bosom is a letter I have hid. It was brought to me this morning by a rider from the Duke. Madam, we regret to inform you that Lord Hartwell died in action, Thursday, said night. As I read it in the white morning sunlight, the letters squirm like snakes. Any answer, madam? said my footman. No, I told him. See that the messenger takes some refreshment. No, no answer. And I walked into the garden, up and down the pattern paths, in my stiff, correct brocade. The blue and yellow flowers stood up proudly in the sun, each one. I stood upright, too, held rigid to the pattern by the stiffness of my gown. Up and down I walked, up and and down. In a month he would have been my husband. In a month here, underneath this lime, we would have broke the pattern. He for me and I for him. He as colonel, I as lady, on this shady seat. He had a whim that sunlight carried blessings, and I answered, It shall be as you have said. Now he is dead. In summer and in winter I shall walk up and down the pattern garden paths, in my stiff brocaded gown. The squills and daffodils will give place to pillared roses and to asters and to snow. I shall go up and down in my gown, gorgeously arrayed, boned and stayed and the softness of my body will be guarded from embrace by each button, hook, and lace. For the man who should loose me is dead, fighting with the Duke in Flanders, in a pattern called war. 
Christ, what are patterns for? End of poem. This recording is in the public domain.